and half past. I'd like to welcome everybody along to the Planning Applications Committee meeting on Tuesday, 25th of October 2016. Could we note that this meeting may be recorded and subsequently made available to the public for listening purposes? And could we make sure the mobiles are switched off, please? Lucy, have you got any apologies? Good morning. I have 17 members present. We are Corit. And I have apologies from Councillor Diggle. Councillor McGregor, Councillor Dick and Councillor McCautry are not present, but may be along later in the meeting. Lucy, have we got any declarations of interest? Nope. Can we go on to... Aye. Aye. Due, due to the fact that we do not have any speakers coming along today, um, I will not run through the usual procedure. Um, the case officer will run through each item in turn. Thank you. Can we go to item three on the agenda, the minutes of the meeting at 27th of September. We agreed. Agreed. Item four on the agenda is the land at Annan Road, Loch Maven, the application for a planning permission in principle for re residential development 16 stroke P stroke 4 stroke 0041. And this is an item that was deferred. Lucy, can you tell us members that will not be able to take part in this? Okay, um, the list of members who can take part in this today are Councillor Martin, Councillor Dempster, Councillor Blake, Councillor Ian Crothers, um, Councillor Diggle, but he's not here, Councillor Drybra, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Geddes, Councillor Groom, Councillor Hislop, Councillor McGregor, Councillor Maitland, Councillor McCoughtry, Councillor McComb, Councillor Councillor Ogilvy, Councillor Syme, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Witts. I've got Lindsay Cameron speaking to this one. Lindsay, I'll run through the slides before we go into back into session. Thank you, Chair. Um, as advised, this application was deferred uh, at the meeting on the 27th of September for a site visit. Um, the site visit took place yesterday afternoon. And I'll just quickly run through the slides just to um, refresh everyone's memory. <laughs> Um, this first slide shows the application site, um, which is located to the west of Annan Road in Loch Maben. It, just, it lies just within the settlement boundary, which follows the, the field boundary line, which is immediately to the south of the site. This photograph is taken looking towards Loch Maben um, on the approach from the south. Uh, you have the tennis courts, Bowling Green and Castle Loch to the right, um, and the application site is on the left of the road, um, and the land rises behind. Moving closer, um, the southern edge of the site um, is located approximately six metres from the hedge which runs perpendicular to the road at the left-hand side of the photo and it extends northwards to meet the existing dwellings towards the right-hand side of the photo. This is a reverse view looking back across the application site. And this photograph is panning round. Uh, this photograph shows the relationship of the, the site to Annan Road and Castle Loch. Um, beyond. And finally, this um, is an indicative site plan, uh, which I believe members were interested to see at the last committee. However, please note that this plan doesn't form part of the application um, and is only for illustrative purposes only. Thank you, Lindsay. Members? Good. Thank you, Chair. I think it was helpful on the site visit yesterday. I think one of the questions that emerges is now seeing the site plan or indicative site plan, um, just to get a sense of the fact that uh, there would be separate entrances for the different dwellings, possibly a couple of them being shared. Um, and that would be directly onto the main road. I think within the papers it suggests there'd be no footpath on that side. Um, but we did notice uh, there's a kind of row of trees, obviously, which would obstruct um, visibility. So I'm just sort of curious what um, what the thoughts are around that uh, in terms of what we saw yesterday. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, in relation to um, access arrangements, um, the indicative site plan does show two shared accesses. Um, however, there, there's no restriction on the number of accesses that could be formed um, in relation to this application. Um, the Council Roads Officer um, is content that satisfactory visibility can be achieved um, and has recommended conditions in relation to street lighting and an extension of 30 mile an hour limit. Um, in order to achieve visibility, it may be necessary to remove um, the existing trees, um, either some or all of them. Um, and in order to um, ensure that um, a satisfactory level of amenity um, and a setting to the town can be achieved, um, uh, some replacement planting could be required should the trees require to be removed. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, that's helpful. And, and I think just in terms of the, the, the extension of the 30 mile an hour and the street lighting, um, I think it was suggested yesterday that that might be roughly where the current sign, uh, the street name for Loch Maben, uh, sorry, the, the town name for the Loch Maben sign is. Um, but that's also in the vicinity of the actual path that goes off on the other side of the road to the uh, the walkway around Castle Loch. So there's like, a, I'm just sort of conscious of the fact that where the boundary of the town would be, or where you might suggest it would be in relation to both sides of the road. Have you got any further detail on that? Well, the settlement boundary for um, Loch Meben um, runs along the, I say, the field boundary to the south of the application <coughs> site, which corresponds with the access to um, to the car park to the rear of, of the bowling green. And is that where the 30 mile an hour limit would be moved to? Um, in relation to the 30 mile an hour limit, it would be extended to, um, to certainly the, the southern end of the application site. Um, the exact location would be determined um, in accordance with the road service. Yeah. Ian. Ah, Chairman, the site visit was very useful. I think Stephen's picked up on the main points. And I think, I suppose, there's been a local aspiration from the community, which Stephen's picking up on, in regards to them 30 mile an hour signs and where they should be located. And I think where Stephen's alluding to would be the appropriate place. So hopefully, if, if this gets approved today, that's that's uh, something that's being listened to by the, the, the case officer who picks up on that at the time, is if a further application comes in. But happy to move the, the recommendations as uh, recommended within the, the, the committee paper itself. Jane. Um, I have no difficulty with the recommendation, but just as a sort of voice of a friendly outsider, um, looking at the um, aspect of Loch Maben um, as you come in, um, the condition that in there at nine, I think is incredibly important. I think we've got the opportunity here to really make a mess of the, uh, the entrance to Loch Maben from that aspect, or to make a really good contribution to it. Um, and um, I think, notwithstanding what we were told yesterday, I think those trees are incredibly important um, and the amenity. So I think what officers have got here, they are quite firm conditions, but I think as a committee, I think that it would be no bad thing to, to voice our opinion that, that, yes, we agree with you, that in fact this should not just be allowed to slide through unchallenged uh, and that it's really important the way that this is orientated Councillor Gilroy might well remember that when we um, had a, a, an issue in Tungland, um, the end house on the, uh, the row of houses that we had entrance to Tungland was very carefully orientated. Um, we were presented with a row of suburban, unprepossessing houses, um, and through the reporter, although it was challenged, we challenged the officers, a recommendation, and the reporters upheld our opinion that it was incredibly important to do um, a proper ending off of the, uh, of the row of houses. And they were properly designed and it was specific to that area. So um, I'm, with that, I'm absolutely happy to agree. Iowa. Nothing further to add. Jim. Thanks, Chair. My colleague, Mrs. Maitland, is quite right to stress the sensitivity of the southern part of the site. There is also sensitivity with regard to amenity 
in the northern part of the site where it narrows uh, quite substantially. But I would assume that these issues will be covered when a full application is submitted. So, you know, this is an application in principle and I have no major objection to this at all. Alistair. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm taking a slightly different tack from people here and looking at paragraph 4.13. Um, we're always warned not you know, to look at the application as is. Nevertheless, on the top of page 16, um, I've written in the margin of my notes, speculative conjecture. Uh, we are invited, we are told that there may be potential for planning permission to be sought in future for further residential development. Um, I don't know why that is there. I thought the whole purpose of planning was to look at the situation as is. And I am concerned that this phrase is here. I'm also puzzled as to what seems to me a contradiction between the first sentence of that paragraph and the, and the second. In the first place, we are, we are reminded, sorry, the second sentence and the third, we're reminded um, that um, anything less than five dwellings is not liable to uh, provide affordable housing. And yet in the ultimate paragraph of this, the ultimate sentence of this paragraph, it says, in order, I had to read this about five times and I'm still none the wiser. In order to ensure the matters of affordable housing and public open space are addressed under the current application, any planning permission should be restricted to a maximum of four dwellings. I don't follow that. That seems to be saying to me, um, we have to consider uh, these matters of affordable housing. Although this is a, a request for only four dwellings. David? Uh, perhaps it's too early in the morning, but I don't get it. There, there are two specific issues there. There is the fact that you've got a larger area of land to the west beyond the application site on the land which rises up that also falls within the settlement boundary. So if you like, this, the first part of that um, paragraph on top of page 16, consequently starting there, is really just putting down a marker that should a further application <coughs> come in for additional houses beyond that area that of the application site, that would trigger the requirement for affordable housing, open space contributions, et cetera, et cetera. So really, this is saying within this current application site, what is being proposed, we understand from the indicative plan, is no more than four houses, which would avoid the need for these things to be triggered for this application. And accordingly, that's why there's a condition that's just actually holding it to that. Because if, if it does come back in with an application for more than uh, five or more houses within the current application site, that would trigger all sorts of additional requirements, which we understand the, the applicant doesn't want to go down that route. So that's why there's a need for a condition here to make it clear that this site can accommodate the four houses, which the indicative plans have shown could be satisfactorily accommodated. The other bit is really say, a marker for the future that should any additional applications come in, because the wording in the supplementary guidance says it's cumulatively or individually will require. So in other words, this would be seen as phase two potentially coming in behind. Now we understand from the meeting yesterday that, that there's no intention to do that, that's fine. So that paragraph really won't follow through in that instance. But there's two issues, as I say, it's the additional bit of land and the current application because four is acceptable, then it's conditioned to that. Okay, we've got no other members. Oh. Um, yeah, so that's actually got me thinking now. Uh, so say there was a phase two, but it was actually a phase one for a new developer on the same parcel of land, which subsequently became, you know, a, uh, how do we tightly protect or ensure that um, an abuse of that doesn't happen. As ever, planning permission runs with the land, not the developer. So you're quite right. The, the owner of the land here can get planning permission and then sell it on, which is why it's important to put down a condition that's stating that with this application, we're looking at a limit of four. 
beyond that, I don't really want to, to go into realms of speculation for the remaining land because we're informed it's not likely to come forward. And as Councillor Woods does point out, then you've got to look at what's before you today. Ian? It was, it was the same question as that Stevens just asked, because it seems, just seems an unusual I take on the point, uh, if a large scale site, you've got to understand, because it is, you have a phase in, but it's a very small scale. I just, sounds a bit complicated to me. Maybe it's, I take on board what's, what David's saying, I take on board what was said yesterday as well at the site meeting in regard to that particular aspect, but it just seems a bit unusual. Perhaps, yeah. Thanks, Chair. I think some of the issues that, that Jane and, and other members have raised is, is, is something that we've done before. This is a planning and principle application. Perhaps the full application should come back to the committee uh, when it comes in so that we can make sure that the issues that were raised are addressed at that particular point. Members agree with the conditions attached here at now, aren't you? With the additional voicing that Councillor Maitland had suggested around uh, the emphasis on uh, which condition was it, seven or nine? Uh, which nine condition six. nine? But I mean, if I come back, if I come back as a full application, we would see that anyway. Front to number five on the agenda, agenda, windy standard wind farm, Carsfern Forest, Carsfern planning application to vary condition 6.42 of the deemed planning permission reference EC3-37 issued by Scottish ministers, condition restricting access to the site of heavy good vehicles to certain specified times, 16 stroke P stroke 2 stroke 0172. And we've got Chris McTeer there speaking on this one. Whenever you're ready, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, only one slide for you today. Um, not as interesting as Lindsay's, I'm afraid it's more a procedural application than anything else. Um, this application relates to phase two of uh, the Windy Standard Wind Farm at Cursfern Forest. Um, phase two was uh, given consent by the Scottish Government under Section 36 of the Electricity Act in 2007 subject to conditions and one of the conditions 6.42 related to site access by heavy goods vehicles and is the subject of this application. Um, the condition was added in the interest of road safety and the immunity of nearby residents and restricted access to between 7 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Monday to Friday and 8 to half past one on Saturdays. Um, the phase two infrastructure works began in 2014 and are now substantially complete. And as in addition to, uh, to this condition, there was another one uh, which the applicant was required to produce a traffic management plan. And part of this plan was to identify abnormal loads coming onto the site. And in this case, the management plan identified the delivery of turbine blades, which would require a police escort whilst they're on the, uh, the public road. Um, Police Scotland have indicated that they will only provide an escort uh, for these abnormal loads out with peak traffic times and in this case it would mean even evening deliveries uh, to the site which will bring the deliveries into conflict with condition 6.42. Um, in normal circumstances if the council were approving something like this we would include a backstop on the condition um, which would allow a degree of flexibility in exceptional circumstances. It would be something along the lines of the, the times and days, unless otherwise agreed with, with the council. Um, so in this case, in order to allow the blade deliveries to take place, the applicant proposes to modify condition 6.42, keeping the access times for regular construction traffic, but allowing for exceptional deliveries um, to be agreed between all parties, uh, and for the reasons set out in the report, it's recommended that this application is approved. Thank you. David. Hi, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Yesterday morning at quarter, quarter to eight, uh, another colleague here and myself were heading for Lockerbie. We got to Brown Rig Loaning and we were stopped. And after a few minutes, this great long lorry came across the roundabout 
at the uh, junction of the Lockerbie Road and the bypass. That one got across, then another one followed it. That one got across, and then a third one followed it. When the third one got across, eventually the uh, traffic started moving, and a number of vehicles in front of us turned left, so they were following these three vehicles, these large vehicles. We were lucky that we were going up to Locker Bay, and the Locker Bay Road was chock-a-block as well, and that stopped people on the Annan Road getting across. Now, where these vehicles came from, and where they're going, and where they continued after that, I don't know. But it's absolutely ridiculous that these vehicles are on such a road. People are trying to get to their work at 8 o'clock in the morning, quarter to 8, and they're getting stopped by these vehicles. These vehicles, in my view, should be taken off the road by the very latest half past six, seven o'clock in the morning. And they should be travelling maybe start eight or nine o'clock at night and travel overnight. There's no way that if that, these lorries were going to Sunrar, the only place they would be, 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 cars would be able to pass them would be on dual carriageway. And they could be stuck there until they got to Sunrar. And God knows how long that would take. So I think we need, we need to look at at the, the travelling of these I, I appreciate, Chair, that this is not what's on on the uh, application, but it's how, how we need to address that issue as well. It's diabolical that these vehicles are stopping people get to their work at starting times in the morning, and no doubt it's happening at other times in the day. I think it is actually on the application, that. Can I? Uh, obviously, I'm unaware of the particular one to which you're referring to, but... It is a, a standard practice that a traffic management plan is required for wind farms and you have to have an agreement with Transport Scotland and the police um, to get the appropriate times. What we're being told with this current application here is that the police are not willing to allow exactly what you experienced. Uh, so I think it's probably to be commended that they don't want to have a repetition of that. And for that reason, that's forced this particular application to come forward. Ian. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I think Councilor McKee's outlined the, the whole business case in regards to this application very well. I think that's the reason it was here in front of us, just to try and avoid this. And I would certainly, certainly, even with the more emphasis that he's put on it in, in regards to the circumstances come across yourself, that I would certainly move the recommendations to approve. I think it'll alleviate any potential further traffic pressure or movements on A75. Alistair. Well, I have an issue uh, not too dissimilar to the one raised by uh, uh, Councillor McKee. So, uh, obviously, I, I wouldn't want to raise it uh, you know, under consideration of this particular item of business. I've already sent an email to the council, you know, to Alistair Speedy, uh, in relation to the council's role, a possible role, uh, as not only as planning authority, but also as, as roads authority. And this is in relation to a consented wind farm in the Wickenshire area. I suspect that my colleague, Councillor McComb, may have had a similar email this morning. Uh, and it's issues off-site uh, which is causing inconvenience. So, as I say, I think it would be worthwhile perhaps uh, raising that uh, or, or discussing it briefly with your leave later on. But, I, you know, I, I don't want to say any more at this stage in relation to this application, Chair. Archie. Thanks very much, Chair. A long way, and, you know, once we get the recommendation, I'll fully support it. But I do agree that the traffic management plan should take these things into consideration when we're, when we're moving forward with them. Jane? It wasn't absolutely clear to me from the report why we actually had 6.42 or equiv uh, in there in the first place. So, uh, I mean, why, why did we restrict it in the first instance? David? Um, honest answer is we didn't. That was uh, something that the Scottish Minister has attached to the condition. But uh, I think, as Chris said at the outset, that the reasoning behind the for them attaching the condition was in terms of road safety and residential amenity. Patsy? Yes, it's just to do with uh, condition 6.42. How, how would you be wanting to reword it exactly? And is, is, um, and how often, how often would, the, would it, the condition have to be disregarded? Is it once a month? Is it every week? Uh, you know, we're, we're not very aware of that. And if it's a Scottish uh, minister's recommendation, can we fiddle it? I mean, can we tweak it, rather? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think a new word's a bit better, Patsy. <laughs> Tweaking it. 
All right, David. Um, yes, I mean, if I can just draw member attention to the top page 36, there's the revised version. Because it's a section 42 application, we've got to reattach all the conditions before. So the only one that has been varied is the new 6.42. So really that is adding in just the extra uh, phrase that except with the prior consent of the planning authority. So unless we agree otherwise, they've got to stick to the, the original hours. Where we would agree to the consent is obviously where Transport Scotland and uh, Police Scotland come back and say, no, we're only willing to allow uh, an escort escort at that particular time, which is out with the, the other conditions. So it would be a rare occurrence. It will only be for very large deliveries. Normally the single largest part which requires an escort is the, the turbine blades because you can't take them in any smaller sections. But the actual turbine towers and the cells and so on, normally they would expect them to be delivered within the normal hours. Uh, well, you, say, you say it's not very often. Is it once every three months, or will it be every month, or you know, how often are we thinking of this? <coughs> well, basically, you will have. Uh, we've got. Sorry, Roy, and Chris. How many turbines was this actually four? But I mean, each turbine will have three blades, so it will be three times however many turbines there were in total, and that will be the extent of the abnormal load delivery. Andy. Thanks very much. Just uh, a bit of advice uh, through you, Chair. Um, are we actually able to stipulate that um, they, they can't operate in convoy? I'll, I'll tell you my, my rationale for that is in my very early days, um, or my younger days, I was part of the escort for uh, the Air North Smith in Vergordon for the, up the old A9, right through the bridges, and it started off with one, then two, then three, then four. I think that's exactly what Jock's getting on about, is the, the consideration for the public is, 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 hasn't been taken into account here. This looks as though this is an exercise to cut down the number of times the police have to escort it or cost for, it can be cost for the, the haulage company because they're still having to, the cost is still there for each and every individual lorry. Um, so uh, are we actually able to say, uh, yes, they can do this, but not in convoy? It would really fall down to the, the transport management plan and the agreement of uh, Police Scotland and Transport Scotland. Again, trying to bring it back to this particular application, what they're actually looking at here is the specific hours. Whether they bring them in ones, twos, or threes would be something which really would have to be agreed by the Police and Transport Scotland in consultation with us. We can certainly suggest that they don't do it in convoys, um, and that would be something which I can certainly relay to roads and planning colleagues who would deal with that. Andy. Uh, thanks. I think that'd be really helpful, David. And um, just with a bit of hindsight here, it's a wonderful thing. Maybe if we'd had um, a better idea of what the transport plan was, uh, you know, it would have given us a clear indication. I know it's a procedural paper, you're absolutely right, but um, we need to be seen to make sure that the, um, the people that we represent as a committee, everything else, are actually being uh, respected, I think, and this is probably the right way to describe this. I think, as David said, they will be put in touch with the police and transport Scotland and give their opinion, but we definitely. Chair, I take a different view. I'd rather see them in convoys, because if you've got, it's not just the blades, because I came out of our house and onto the bypass, and the nasal and the, the bit where the blades go into the actual, like the propeller middle, they come in separate, so they need a convoy. Now, if you're going to have 150 pieces going up there, that's 150 times you're going to have a police car in front, a police car behind, nobody able to overtake them. Surely you'd be better having five at a time. Yes, it's a long convoy, but they don't get out the road. They stay in the road till they get there. Now, you're as well having 30 times that than 150 times that. Um, there, it seems a sensible thing to actually re reduce the condition as what's in the paper. But we've also got nighttime traffic, which our economy relies on over in the west where we're going to the ferries. Now, when is a quiet time in that A75? Because you get different times all through the day. So to say that, oh, well, we'll just have it off peak, does that mean say every two hours, and it'll take longer than two hours for those blades to get along the road, 
are they going to pull off somewhere to let the cars go to the ferry traffic? I think we need to look at that as a, an area in the tra uh, traffic management plan. What are we doing to protect the economic viability of our uh, ports? It's from uh, Ken Ryan. I think the traffic management plan will be down to the police and the Transport Scotland. Is that right, David? Sent down to place in the transport. Jim? I, I, I think maybe Alistair Geddes is suggesting we will be discussing afterwards. It, it might be useful. But, but my take on, on the point I was making is if a police rest go in one long vehicle and they, 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 they have a crate, <coughs> they create a, a, a backlog of vehicles, they can pull it in and allow them by. You can't pull a convoy in. And I, I, I've followed tractors in convoy, and it's the most frustrating thing. So you get one. By maybe, and and that 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 so there is an issue, and, and maybe it's a useful discussion for later. Archie, see, so, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how often Police Scotland will be available for uh, convoys because of what they're happening with different communities as well. But I, I, I've just been given a good idea to take forward to Enterprise and DNG that I'll uh, take forward for for escorting ve uh, vehicles for wind farm. The members agreed. Agreed. Right, I'm six, Hardgate Primary School, Hardgate, Hardgate Castle Douglas, planning application for the erection of a detached nursery building, 16 stroke P stroke 2 stroke 0208. And we've got Judith speaking in this one. Whenever you're ready, Judith. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's an application for um, proposed nursery building at Hardgate Primary School um, in the village of Hardgate Castle Douglas. The first slide is the application site, um, which is on the, the edge of Hargate Village. Um, it includes the existing primary school and also the existing prefabricated nursery accommodation. The application site fronts um, the public road called School Bray, which links the villages of Hargate and Hockover. It's a closer up block plan. Um, so I think that the existing primary school building is this. This is the nursery building. We've got the playgrounds up here, and this is the tarmac play area of courts. The proposed nursery location is in the north of the site on this grass area to the north. This is the site plan of the proposed nursery. Um, the existing primary school building, uh, part of it anyway, is on the right-hand side, and the proposed nursery uh, to the left-hand side of the drawing. The ground levels fall away towards the north. The north is to the left-hand side, um, so there will be some filling up of levels required. This is the floor plan. The building features a, a quadrant playroom with an adjacent outdoor soft play area um, and the outdoor play area would be fenced in. On two sides of the, the quadrant playroom is ancillary accommodation of cloakrooms, offices, stores, plant rooms and the like. <coughs> this is the existing primary school elevations. The northwest elevation on the top is the one facing the public road school bray and the bottom one has the outlook towards the fields at the rear. This is the elevation, these are the elevations of the proposed nursery. The first one in the top left is the one that would be facing School Bray. Um, the next to it in top right would be to the, facing the fields to the rear. The middle one left is northeast elevation towards Hargate. Um, the middle right is the elevation towards the existing school. And the one at the bottom is, <laughs> is the elevation um, from the, the courtyards across towards the soft play area um, and the two doors are from the, the internal playroom. The external walls would be finished uh, partly in modified timber boarding and part render. This is the roof plan. Um, there's a pitched roof element over the playroom and it would be finished in fibre cement, artificial roof, roof slates, artificial slates, 
and the flat roof part, which is black on the plan, would be finished in standing steam, steam zinc. These are the sections. Um, there's a small plan key shown at the bottom. The AA is through the playroom and the pitched roof, and BB and CC are sections through the flat roof element with the elements with the upstand of the pitch roof section shown. Existing and proposed sections, um, section DD in the middle, um, like the fourth one down, it shows uh, the elevation of the existing building from Schoolbury and the section through the nursery, proposed nursery at that point. <coughs> Moving on to the, oh, maybe not, not me. Right. What's that? Oh, right. Um, moving on to the photographs, the images. This is um, taken from the, the C58, which is a public road on the other side of the village, um, taken across, and I've marked in there where, where the proposed nursery would be. This is the view over site from the north corner. Um, the, the nursery would be just in, immediately, immediately in front on, in the foreground there on the grass. And Schoolbury, the public road, is on the right-hand side of that image. This is a view along in the front of the existing primary school. Um, the, the road, Schoolbury, is to the, the left-hand side of that image. And the, the nursery would be through the through the, the gates in the grass in, in this part. This is just taken from the gates um, into the grass area where the, the nursery would be, and you can see Hardgate visible in the distance. This is just taken from the road looking into the site with, you can see, existing school buildings on the right-hand side. This is from the rear of the primary school. Um, you can see the existing school building is made up of the original stone part plus various extensions. The existing nursery accommodation is just available, just sticking out of the corner at the end of, of the, the building there. It's quite a tight site, so it's difficult to get um, pictures. But this one here is taken from the front, looking along um, over the existing prefabricated building. And this is a, not taken on the site. This was when I asked what the fencing would look like that I was supplied with this to show what the fencing, which would enclose the soft play area, would look like. <coughs> so in conclusion, and as detailed in the report, the application is recommended for approval subject to the condition on finishes. Thank you, Dave. Do you the members? <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm actually delighted that they're actually starting to um, address the, the, the accommodation issues there and to support this application. The only one we worry I've got here is that the, the last sentence in 1.2, it's an area designated by SEPA with surface water medium likelihood of flooding. And there doesn't seem to be anything in the recommend, in the, um, uh, the decisions uh, as to how we've got to address that. The conditions, yeah. So, I mean, if, if there's a way we can word that so that it makes sure, because we, we didn't want a catastrophe in our hands at a later time, and then someone's got to say, who the hell gave plan permission for that? Um, I, other than that, I'm totally delighted with the, uh, the plans to address <coughs> the issue about the, the, the provision. Um, there are really just very, very small parts of the site, and it's... Um, surface water flooding, and it's just... Yeah. There's just very, very small parts just down, down this side here. So it's really not near the area of... It's much lower level than the proposed building, um, and it's just um, surface water. So I... I, I Sorry, I, I wasn't even in the building so much, Chair. It was actually the children who were playing. Right. Um, we need some safety measures there so the kids don't get drowned. Uh, 
<laughs> well, I certainly don't want anybody drowned, but okay. um, I, I, I think we're maybe slightly over-egging the pudding, um, given the topography of the area. Um, I, I just wanted to say I, I commend this. Um, I think the, it's a good design. Um, I'm a little doubtful about the fencing, which I think looks a bit like a dog run. Um, but um, the, the rest of it, I think, is to be commended. And I'm very glad you did actually show the... Um, <laughs> the current arrangements in Hardgate for the nursery, uh, which have been like, like that, I think, for the last 20 years, and uh, I'm very glad to see it cha being changed. So I would uh, commend this um, and agree the recommendation. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm just a wee bit concerned about 1-4, where it says the ground would be raised locally. It will be raised, but it will still be over a foot below the level of the adjacent playground. Now, I assume a very effective drainage system is going to be put in, but there is no mention of that. You know, I but th that's the small areas along the eastern boundary, which Councillor Ferguson was talking about. I'm talking about the, the actual finished floor level, which will be below the level of the playground. Chair, I think the, the slide that you just got up there actually shows the situation quite well, that they will be raising the ground level for building the, the nursery, but there is a relatively small slope down. That's something which would normally be covered at the building regulation stage just to ensure that it is properly trapped and drained. So I wouldn't foresee that as any significant challenge given the level of fall there. Right, see? Yes, it's just a reassurance from, from Judith. You're taking in some of the present green space to do this. Uh, is there enough left for that size of school? Um, I think it's important that they've got that green space in order to make use of. Um, I assume there's plenty, plenty um, space left, but we haven't done an assessment on on um, pupils and amount of space. If that that has to be done. But it's been designed by the architect's department, our architect's department. Right, see. But has anybody consulted with the education department that, that, that this is as, that they're not losing more? You know, there's got to be a certain amount of green space there if there's some there already, and one, one, one would hope we could keep as much as possible. And just want to know that there is enough because we don't want it all tarmac or built on. Sure, given that the application is actually from the, the education department then you would have to assume that they are satisfied with what they're proposing in planning terms there is no requirement the, this isn't a recognized area of public open space it's just amenity land that's associated with the school um, but i think the the block plan which you have you can scroll back it does show the the level of land which is still actually going to be remaining so I think it's a relatively small footprint in the grand scheme of things yes that's a better one so you can see that there's Really what we're talking about is just the, the top corner of that photo there and the land falling down to the south from that will still remain. Plus you have the playground. So in pure planning, and you're probably going to be losing the, the area of where you've got the <coughs> porter cabin at the moment. So overall, I wouldn't be remotely concerned about that in planning terms, provided it meets educational requirements, which I presume the education department know before submitting their own application that it should be okay. Alistair Geddes. Thanks, Chair. I've, let me say for the record that I have no problems whatsoever with the application or indeed uh, granting approval. A couple of minor points. 2.3, paragraph 2.3 and paragraph 2.4. 2.3, Scottish water, no response received at time of writing report. As far as I'm concerned, Chair, they are statutory consultees. They're obliged to give us their opinion to allow us to take decisions on the fullest and the basis of the fullest possible information. And yet again, I would suggest that that simply isn't acceptable. And maybe it's about time we've got our MSPs involved, you know, uh, as it were, with a view to, sort of, to bringing them to heel. 2.4, Council Flood Risk Management. Can I ask, Chair, why no response? Uh, well, firstly, 
Uh, was there a response received from the Council Flood Risk Management team? Uh, and if not, why not? Yeah. Uh, no, at the time of writing the report, there was no response had been received. Um, but I, I can't remember if I chased it up. I probably did, but I wasn't concerned about the flooding since the flooding was a minor part of it. And I, I felt that they had been, they had been consulted um, because it showed flooding, but the fact that it was surface water flooding and not flooding from a water course did not concern me. Yeah, Alistair. As far as I'm concerned, sir, it's no good administrative practice. You know, all you need is a brief response. You know, uh, as I say, we're not asking for something which could be submitted for the Booker Prize for literature. You know, but you know, that, that, this to me is symptomatic of, of slipping standards, and it's not acceptable, and particularly not in relation to 2.3 Scottish Water. Archie. Thank you. I, I, like, well, like Alistair and other people, I've got no concerns about the application itself. It's coming back to the point where Councillor Ferguson actually said. When you talk about the fence around the play area, we got the play area and the nursery, which would stop the children going down to the flooded area, which would, I think, cover what Councillor Ferguson was saying. Yeah. Is, is, there a, is there a fence around the play area? Yes. Yes, there is a fence around the play area, and it's as shown in the photograph. Thank you. Yeah, just for clarity, so the fence is out with the area that may flood. There's a medium risk we've got here. That's my whole point. If the fence, if, if the kids are fenced in, and it's an area that, that it could flood, is inside the play area, we've got a problem at school playtimes. And we should be looking at that now rather than letting a disaster happen and then saying, why the hell did that happen? Yeah. Um, the, flood, the, the flooding area is along the edge of the, the site and the, the fencing is here. It encloses this area here. And the flooding is just part in, in I think it's two parts just coming in to the boundary down here, and the, the fencing is around this area here. Andy. Thanks. As, as I said for the outset, I'm totally supportive of this whole application, and I'm happy to leave it with David and his team to make sure that uh, the, the, the area is safe for the children, and that's taken into account when we could make a decision here today. And other than that, I'm, I'm perfectly happy and delighted, in fact, that, uh, that, uh, this development, but I'm just worried that if we have metal fences and there's an area where it could flood, we could end up with a pond or something where some kids could actually get into danger. That's my only worry, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to leave that with David and his team to sort out with the uh, schools. Alistair. Thank you, Chair. I'm absolutely in, in support of this development. Uh, better uh, nursery provision in rural areas is uh, um, one of my pet projects. I'm always banging on about it to the despair of some colleagues, but never mind. Uh, what I wanted to raise, though, was an officer herself said it's a tight site. So I presume that during the construction phase, the, the, uh, uh, the work of the school and the existing nursery will go on. So my concern is for uh, safety, and I presume that that's going to be taken on board. Ian. Thank you, Chairman. If it, if there's been a lot of discussion about flooding. I think we've got to remember that this site is near the top of a hill. That if there was going to be any minor flooding, it would be very... Wait a minute, Ian. I think Alistair wants an answer. It's safe. Health and safety will be taken. Uh, very excuse me, Chair. I thought, that, I thought David was about to say something <coughs> in response to my comments. Well, just to, re just to reassure you that um, basically, yes, there are separate pieces of legislation, both under the building standards and health and safety executive that require uh, building sites to ensure that that would be looked after. Yes. Yeah, continue, can you please? Thank, thank you. Uh, just to reiterate that this site is on near, near the top of a hill. If there were going to be a flooding issue, the Hawkeaver and the entire Dolbeti and surrounds would be under me many metres of water. Any surface water would be no more than a, a puddle. I would just move the recommendation. Iowa. Chair, uh, I'm not going to move against it, but I don't think it's a good design. I don't like the look of the building. 
I'm a pitched roof man rather than this fancy flat roof. But uh, I just thought I'd have my say as well. Right, members in agreement. Right, thank you. Their business, call it a meeting. As I say, members are agreed. I think Alistair suggested that we could maybe have a short discussion on the transport issues affecting some of the wind farms. Alistair. Very grateful to you, first of all, Chairman, you know, uh, for, for, for allowing me to, to raise the point. Um, the thrust of my question, sir, would be how detailed and how far reaching are our traffic management plans? Because uh, the situation uh, this morning, uh, Guy had sent an email into which I was copied. Uh, he wasn't the best pleased at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I had a couple of, couple of vehicles uh, bringing in uh, wind farm uh, component parts. Hadn't been able to get access. It's a consented wind farm application, obviously. Hadn't been able to get access uh, to, to the, uh, the wind farm. Uh, lay up in a, a lay by, which, uh, after all, chair is what a lay by is, is there for. Uh, it's in reasonable proximity to certain uh, uh, houses, not all that many, but uh, it was a cold night in Mid Galloway last night, and according to the complainer, uh, you know, they switched on the, uh, the, 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 the engines and the vehicles, probably to keep themselves warm, you know, before. This would, I think, would be a bit between five and six o'clock in the morning. Uh, as I say, uh, disturbed the peace, according to him. Uh, and as I say, Kilgallyog have come. Uh, sorry, sh I shouldn't have said that. Uh, the, wind the, wind the, wind farm the wind farm operators have come back and sort of tried to justify the situation. It seems to me I've already contacted uh, Alistair Speedy, asked you know what the council, if anything, can do from the point of view of being uh, planning and roads authority to help to ameliorate such situations. But it seems to me, Chair, that the issue is how far-reaching uh, and how reasonable you know can conditions in a traffic management plan be. I know it's an unusual set of circumstances, but you know it's not just you know taking the stuff uh, to uh, the, the consented wind farms. As I say, in a case like this, in certain circumstances, they may have to, you know, the, the, the transporters may have to lie up, uh, and it can, uh, as a consequence, can be causing, uh, as it were, uh, annoyance to people who are having to live in reasonably close proximity, as, uh, as the complainer does. And, and that's the issue. Uh, I suspect that other members may have met it on behalf of constituents, and it would be worthwhile looking at whether or not, you know, we can, whether there is any power we can, we, we can exercise in an effort to try to ameliorate complaints of this nature. Thank you, it's much the same, and, and, and I'll give an example of the Sanker one. There are vehicles consistently parking in Blacadia Road on the foot, the only single footway that they cover it completely. <coughs> vehicles and, and sit overnight with night heaters running. That's what you're talking about, Alistair. They've destroyed a, a, a 150 year old bridge because it had a seven and a half ton limit on it. We removed it to accommodate them. The bridge has been knocked down now and it's lying in bits currently. And I've had to raise roads issues with Keith Brown because I've got a, a wood extraction, I've got Scottish Power putting a new transformer in, and I've got this wind farm going in, and the road's being destroyed. They've created passing places in the park, there are vehicles up there. And the thing about the traffic management plan is, there's a 20 mile an hour agreed speed limit that nobody adheres to. So it's how, and I've been at the police obviously, I've been at the transport people, I've, I've been at Keith Brown, the roads man, but it's constituents that come to light tell us and me complaining, and, and there doesn't seem to be the, 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 the I don't know the willpower is the wrong thing to say, the determination to put an end to that, neither by the police, because it's a voluntary speed limit. These folk are parking, but the police have, have bigger uh, issues in, in managing their, 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 their force, and, and apparently menial tasks don't uh, 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 excite them. And we're getting roads destroyed, and, and it's how to get them maintained, kept, and, and, and ensure that the, that the general public are moving up and doing their roads are no inconvenience. So there's a big issue. If Alistair sees it in the west, and I'm seeing it in the north, I presume it will be prevalent elsewhere as well. Is there anything in the planning that needs? It's, uh, it, it's quite a tricky situation. I'm listening carefully to what members are saying. Yes, there is a planning condition on most wind farm applications requiring a traffic management plan. However, it does involve and require the involvement of uh, third parties. And 
very often, as you have highlighted, them using their enforcement powers rather than the planning enforcement powers. We can deal with physical structures being unauthorized. Mm -hmm. What we can't as planners do is control somebody parking on a public road in a lay-by and then uh, operating things out with what you might call social hours. We can't control speed limits. These are all things that actually fall to other parties. So it's a little bit frustrating for me. I, I'm totally hearing your, your concerns, but some of them I can't actually address. We do have to require a traffic management plan that we can control. We can make sure that it does have all the things you would expect to see included in it. But very often we're entirely dependent on what comes back from local roads, Transport Scotland, and indeed Police Scotland. And these are the parties that will generally administer. And well, the, the very fact you've got this application uh, on the agenda today under section 42 to vary the terms of condition came about entirely because the external parties weren't willing to agree to the conditions that had been attached by the Scottish ministers. So that those parties do have a very strong influence in the outcomes on this. Um, what I can do is, unfortunately, Robert Duncan's not here. Robert, as the respective team leader, normally deals with the, the wind farms and the discharge of traffic management plans. If it would be of use for members who are concerned about this, I can try and arrange a, a separate meeting with Robert, myself, and the respective roads officers to try and just hear what the concerns are and to explore the extent of our powers and what we can deal with and what we can't deal with. Jim, I'll let you back in, and as I say, I think it's kind of pointless just going round in circles with him when we've not got the them here to answer. So I think what David said would be a pretty good idea, like to have a separate meeting with the relevant officials here. No, I think that'd be useful as well. Chair, the only thing I was going to say was just how stringent can we apply conditions? Because if you go to many of these roadworks now on the A trunk roads, there's a convoy vehicle. That, that controls the speed of the vehicles going through. So if folk are compliant, we'll maybe have a position where if we're going to call it back in the future, we can insist that convoy vehicles manage. It, it's, it, it's somehow to move forward to a position where we can give constituents confidence that they folk will adhere to the, <coughs> the, the traffic management plan that's agreed because that you, you always advise us there's no point in putting conditions in that you can't enforce, and we're agreeing a traffic management plan that's no use to us. That's no use either. Right, I'll let, I'll let you in, David, if it's just a quickie. Right, it's just a quickie. We're talking about traffic management plans, and what we've looked at today is access to the site. But what about when they come into the region and get to the, get to the site? It's all the damage and inconvenience they're causing. <coughs> Somebody set a record that lot yesterday come to Newcastle. So God knows what kind of disturbance they've done across the country travelling to Newcastle. And it's, it's these issues as well. It's not just the site that's an issue. I don't think, Thanks, the, Joe, I don't think the traffic management plan just includes uh, going into the site. It'll mean getting from the port or everywhere they bring them in to the site. So as I think it encompasses the whole range, not just going into the site. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's nothing to do with the traffic management, but it's actually to deal with the company on site as well. I've, I've, I've dealt with recently the Beckburn, which is just across the border. And actually talking to the site manager is a good way of trying to get some of the roads um, defect issues sorted out because they do have a budget which they can give to local authorities to say, can you do that part of the road for me? So uh, if you talk to the site managers, we will then go into the project manager. And they, have, they do have a budget for that particular thing. David. Yeah, there's a number of different issues here. The, the Section 42 application, which you've just considered, was to do with access to the site. It wasn't to do with a traffic management plan. As Chris alluded to earlier, there was a traffic management plan condition as well, but that wasn't the one that was varied. In terms of the maintenance of roads and damage, which is uh, directly attributable, then that is covered normally by what's called a Section 69 agreement, or a, even a Section 96 <coughs> agreement of the Road Scotland Act, which covers that so that there's normally a survey before and after taking place and wherever works or damage is directly attributable and that's the developer pays for that. Really in terms of the enforceability, the condition requires the submission of a traffic management plan to um, be agreed by all the relevant parties. 
thereafter, it's some of the issues we can enforce as a planning authority, but many of them we can't, and that includes things like speed limits and so on. That's where you're dependent on other parties. So they're not ideal, but I would certainly suggest it's still better to have a traffic management plan than not to have a traffic management plan. At least it is trying to force the developer to not just randomly throw things into the site at certain antisocial hours, but to actually think about it and get it agreed with the relevant parties. But I would just reiterate the offer to try and set up a meeting with that. If any That's members who are interested in that could email me just to express their interest and I'll make sure you're included. I think that would be good. Right, no other business. Thank you very much. And Andy, come on then. Okay, because it's a question, it's about lay-bys, because I think we're missing a trick here, because there is no, um, if I can see for the traffic management plan, we're doing things to the roundabouts, but there is no facility for vehicles to be pulled over to allow other vehicles who are, are on a time schedule right, without having to speed to get to the ferries, as I've referred to earlier. And I'm, well, the question I was going to ask David was, is, is there a way in the traffic management the process that we can actually have lay built which are big enough to hold these things because the current ones aren't big enough, other than maybe one or two of the whole region, right? Because it's a trick we've got because we, what actually happens after they've done that, because they, I know they did it in, in Perth, in Ross and Inverness years ago, right? they actually made these big lay so they, they could be pulled off the road so that traffic could get past reduce the congestion and and the, the the bonus for the two local authorities was they had these massive laybys which had been funded by the, the company transporting the, 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 the wide loads so i'm asking the question i'm is david can we have a look at these and see if that's actually possible and to build it into conditions that was my question i think uh, i think uh, that's what we'd come up when we're speaking to all the officers not just uh, planning that when you come in with the police, etc., everybody. So that's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not saying it's not a valid question, Andy, but as I say, you're better getting it through the horse's mouth than when everybody's involved. <laughs>